Today I will be reading from Romans chapter 15, verses 1 through 13. We who are strong have an obligation to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. Let each of us please his neighbor for his good, to build him up. For Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. For whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction, that through endurance and through the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another, in accord with Christ Jesus, that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you to the glory of God. For I tell you that Christ became a servant to the circumcised to show God's truthfulness in order to confirm the promises given to the patriarchs and in order that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy as it is written, therefore I will praise you among the Gentiles and sing to your name. And again it is said, rejoice O Gentiles with his people. And again, praise the Lord all you Gentiles and let all the peoples extol him. And again Isaiah says, the root of Jesse will come even he who arises to rule the Gentiles, in him will the Gentiles hope. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. This is the word of the Lord. So by way of recap, let's talk a little bit about what we did the last couple weeks. Uh, the topic of Romans 14 has been important for us as a church as we've thought about how to love one another and how it's um, important for us as a church because um, the opposite threatens to divide us, and, and it, it, it threatens to keep our church from doing what God wants us to do, to display his glory to the world. And so Paul actually talked to us about how to deal with Christian liberty within the context of the church, and how we ought to give grace to one another as well. And Paul talked about how addressing conflict with one another, um, who have different personal convictions, have brought something unique into the context of the church. Whereas, as we saw in the reading just now, the strong tend to look down at the weak, and the weak often condemn the strong because of their liberty, and it creates all kinds of problems within the context of the church, including but not limited to complaining against one another, creating factions in the early church, questioning the faith of others, and even sometimes trying to prove others wrong or that they're not really following the Lord. But Paul has done his best over the last chapter to help us to understand that he forbids all such judging and character assassination by the strong or the weak, and has urged the weak not to put external rules upon others, and for the strong to not become a stumbling block to other people and destroy their faith. And we've talked about over the last couple weeks how this creates so many parallels to the modern church experience, where it seems like uh, we kind of thrive in the controversy and work hard sometimes at creating rifts and divisions amongst the church. Um, I got several emails from you last week uh, commending me on my sermon for Romans 14 and talking about how Tom, what he spoke about two weeks ago was so important for our church. And I would just say, if you haven't heard those sermons, please go back and listen. I feel like they were a gift to us during this time and season of our lives as a church community. So read Romans 14. It's for you, it's for us as a church community. And go back and listen to those sermons if you haven't heard them yet. Uh, but today we turn a corner a little bit because the elephant in the room is that Paul's writings to the church may sound kind of wildly optimistic because of the ubiquity of conflict, of problems, and division in the church. So this morning, in a sense, we get to stand in opposition to that type of opposition today and say with one voice that it's not overly optimistic at all, but it's something we should believe in and it's something we should hope for that it can happen within the context of the church. If we commit ourselves to the vision that God has given to us, that God has made plain through the scriptures for us to know, and more importantly, through the example and work of the person of Jesus Christ. But make no mistake, it's going to take some reorientation for us if we believe the narrative of the age. Because the narrative of the age is different, is it not? I've read some books in the last few weeks, and I've been listening to a podcast recently that have all been alarming to me, to say the least. Um, I'll just give you an example of some of the books. The books I've read were one called Fault Lines by Vadi Bakum, who's the Dean of Theology at a seminary in Zambia. I read a book called Jesus and John Wayne by Kristen Cobes-Dumay, who's a historian from Calvin College. 
And I read another, another book called A Church Called Tove by Scott McKnight, who's a New Testament theologian, and uh, Laura Beringer, who's his daughter and a member of Willow Creek Community Church and has witnessed kind of the mess that's gone there over the last year or so that we've heard about it in the news. Uh, the podcast I've been listening to is called The Rise and, Hill, uh, Rise and Fall of Mars Hill from Christianity Today. And if you haven't heard of this, you've been living under a rock, apparently. Now, my point in telling you about these resources is not to offer recommendations this morning or talk about positives or negatives of these things. I'm happy to do that over coffee. Uh, you can email me. I'd love to chat about those things. Rather, I tell you about these things because each of these resources, in some ways, has actually caused cynicism in me about the hope of the future of the church. Now, uh, in particular, the church in America, I suppose. Now, I don't know if this is a byproduct of these things or the purpose of them or not. Uh, I mean, I'm okay with reading about what's happening under the hood of the church. I'm part of the church. I can tell you some of the issues that are involved in the church as well. Um, And I can even mourn with you about some of the things we've heard over the last few years. I mean, stories of abuse, stories of narcissism, stories of injustice, uh, stories of division, and stories that are supposed to scare you, apparently, into thinking that if you listen to some other believer out there about their perspective on some certain social issue, you're actually jettisoning the gospel altogether and destroying the church. Um, The overall picture is somewhat bleak, honestly, and I'm kind of like, man, what is going on in the context of our church community? especially in the Western church, especially in America. And I found myself feeling a little bit hopeless as I read these books. Now, I do want to say that I'm super glad for these resources we have. We live in an incredible time, folks. We get publishing industries and things like that we can read. I mean, I have my my computer, and in my computer, they've jammed all these Bible resources that I've spent thousands of dollars on, by the way, throughout the years, but they've jammed them all together, and I can carry it around this little 13-inch MacBook that I have, and I have all these resources at my fingertips, and it is an amazing time. What an amazing gift of God to have all these amazing, cool things as well, and so I'm glad we have these in our day and age, but I'm also finding when I immerse myself into some of the things that I hear, some of the narrative of the age, as I just said, I can get pretty pessimistic about the future. And honestly, it also has seemed to me that this has caused some people to abandon the ship of Christian faith altogether, or to cause them to create some deconstruction in their lives of faith as well. Friends, I understand the need to peek under the hood at times. I understand the need to even uh, try to rediscover for yourself what Christianity is all about. But don't live in the deconstruction phase, and hear me. Don't buy into the narrative of the age that everything is going bad and the sky is always falling, okay? This is important for us as a church community. The point of our passage today is for us to have hope in the church as well. And so part of my job this morning is to give you a little bit of hope, knowing that we're not just burying our heads in the stand, not understanding that there are indeed issues that we can talk about and work to fix and work out justice in 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 the church community as much as we can, but to know that we can't live pessimistically or it can actually work in opposition to the faith that God is trying to establish in you and the hope that he wants to give you as well. So that's part of my message purpose today in some ways. But the bigger purpose of my message is really to help you understand why and how you can actually have hope in your life in Christ and in this beautiful and messy family that we call the church. So again, we shift gears a little bit today. Even though we are supposed to keep in mind what Paul's been telling us already, kind of the negatives of Romans 14, Paul moves us forward today in a beautiful way. Not to focus on the issues that divide us, but focus on the one who actually unites us and is working to unite us into one family. And of course, that person is none other than Jesus Christ. And so the majority of my message today is just going to give you a portrait of Jesus. And from that portrait, I think we actually gain a super hopeful future vision of the church and the family of God. In other words, hear me, the issues are certainly there, but let's not get stuck on them together. Let's have some hope in the future because of what Christ has done. So this portrait of what Jesus and who Jesus is in Romans 15, 1 through 13 is actually in a couple parts today, and maybe you saw this as Eric was reading it, but the first part is Christ the example, and the second part is Christ the servant. And these are the two images, the portraits, if you will, that we get of Jesus in this scripture. And we're just going to work through these this morning in our sermon in the time that we have remaining. So we'll start with Christ the example, and we see this in Romans 15, verses 1 through 7. Look back with me if it's your, your Bible, if you have your Bible there in verses 1 through 3, where Paul writes, We who are strong have this obligation to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. Let each of us please his neighbor for his good to build him up. For Christ did not please himself, 
but as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. So we see this part one of having some hope in the future of the church is learning that Jesus Christ showed us the way we ought to live and treat one another and had an example for how the church should function as a community. And here's how he says it. The first one is this, in bearing one another. That's what Paul says in his phrase there. And verse one, we have a strong obligation to bear with the failings of the weak. We have this obligation, is what Paul says. Obligation is a cool Greek word. It's actually a Greek word that means owing someone a debt of money. So just don't think of it as kind of a necessary thing. Think of it as a debt. Verse 3 says, you have this debt for Christ did it for you. So it's all based in the example of Jesus Christ right there. And we've noticed throughout Romans 14 and 15 how strong and weak have been this theme that has played a big part in these chapters. And so we have to rethink a little bit about how we think of strong and weak in the world and in the church as well. I mean, the world thinks that those who are strong should actually use their strength as an advantage for themselves, and sometimes to take advantage of those who are weak. The vulnerability of another is often seen as this opportunity for the strong to gain something at the expense of the weak. Now, friends, you should know, but this is evil, (laughs) and the Bible turns this absolutely upside down. Following Jesus should give us a transformed mind regarding the strong and the weak. And here's the crazy thought. Those who are strong actually owe something to those who are weak. That's the biblical picture is what we see here. Uh, Owe a debt of money, an obligation, if you will. Those who are strong owe something to the weak. They are to come to their aid. Have you ever noticed how in the Old Testament, the law, the widows, the orphans, and the aliens were always given special considerations? Have you always wondered why that is the case? They're given protection and benefits according to the Mosaic law and according to the cultural norms for the Israelites back in the day. So not only these helpless people not to be taken advantage of, they were to be helped by God's people who had the opportunity to care for them as best they could. And if you think this is just an Old Testament law, it's not. Even Jesus taught the same thing. And Jesus has strong words of rebuke for the leaders of Israel who abused their power. You should read Matthew 23 if you want to know more about that. But he taught his disciples that while most people misuse their power and use people, the disciples were to use their power to serve people, to do things exactly opposite. And the reason they do this is because this is the way that Jesus did it. I mean, he even talked about this so beautifully in Mark chapter 10, which includes such saying as this. But many of you who are first will be last, and the last will be first. It's Mark 10, 31. And also, maybe even more famously, but whoever would be great among you must be your servant, and whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Mark 10, verses 43 through 45. A picture of the strong serving the weak. Who's stronger than Jesus? That's rhetorical, of course, right? No one is. He's the one who's the strongest, and he is serving the weakest of us in the world. This changes some definitions for me. Uh, in some ways, I've always thought of this phrase when I've read in, Mark, uh, excuse me, in Romans 15 before of bearing one another as just putting up with someone is what I've thought of this. Like when I think of bearing with someone, I think oh, I've just got to put up with all their shenanigans is what I think, of course. But you should know, and I should know now, that this is not Paul's meaning. When we read about bearing in the scriptures, we need to think of a different image. It's an image of not only owing a debt to someone, but it's the image of either one, carrying something, or two, even picking up something. That's the image that Paul is giving to us. For example, when we say that Christ bore our sins, it means that he carried our sins. It doesn't just mean that he put up with our shenanigans and our sins. And Christ had to carry our sins in order to reconcile us to God. This is what he had to do. And in the same way, Paul is not saying to just put up with the weak among you. He's actually saying that the strong should carry the weak among us. And that's a different paradigm altogether. Christians are to be a people who follow the example of Christ and feel like we actually owe it to other people to carry them as much as we can when they cannot carry themselves or when they differ differ from us in some way, shape, or form. This is the obligation that we who are strong, who are Christians today have. That's one example that Christ has. Another one is this, number two, in not pleasing ourselves, but in pleasing our neighbors is what Paul writes. This is the language that Paul uses about what Jesus did. 
that we carry each other's burdens, but we don't just do it to please ourselves. Rather, as Paul says, let each of us please, which is an imperative statement in Romans 15, verse 2. And we should read it as this, you must please your neighbor. It's our calling as Christians that we are called to do in a positive sense. And in verses 1 and 2, therefore, we're commanded to actively seek our neighbor's good, to build them up. And if we must we, if we want to see ourselves as true followers of Jesus, as our example, even as disagreements come up, and even as we struggle to figure out how to live in unity with one another, questions become not what do I want, but what do you want? Or they, we must not ask what do I need from this church community, but what do you need from me in this church community? It's different. It changes our perspective. Our idea is not pleasing ourselves. So many people in the world come to church to please themselves or to get some sort of religious hire to feel like they created some religious duty. And when they come and they're disappointed, they walk away and say, well, that wasn't the church for me. Well, let me say this. Can you be the church for them instead then? Will you come and be part of it to not please yourself but please other people and to be more concerned with other people's well-being than our own desires and pushing for our own perspectives is what the Bible teaches. And this is an important word. It's Christ-like. And here's the funny thing. I know it's not fair. I know it. I know this doesn't feel right. I mean, when we realize that we actually have to regulate our conduct because of someone else's weakness, it fights against our cultural sense of norms, of personal freedoms and perspectives. I mean, you might say, well, they're the dummy who's weak. Why would I have to stay with them? Why would I have to deal with them? Why do I have to suffer for their weakness? Where's the justice in that? But when the love of Christ is in control of our lives, that's when things change, and we become willing to put others' interests before our own in a spirit of unselfishness. This is the picture of what Christ has done. Christ, the example who's done this for us. It's even compelling to me how Paul not only tells us not to please ourselves, but he tells us to take it a step further, to not just look after yourself, but to look after the other people, to please other people as well. Now, I don't know about you, but I've been told all of my life that being a people pleaser was a bad thing. You've probably heard this as well. I mean, if you type, am I a people pleaser in Google, I did this this week, by the way, you will find results like 10 signs you're a people pleaser and how to stop being a people pleaser and the like. And for some of us, we do need to learn how to not to base our identity on what other people think of us. I understand that. But don't mix that up with the self-sacrificial attitudes and actions that are the callings for a person who is in Christ. And this means we have a different way of viewing people altogether. It means that we listen to people with charity and respect, even those we disagree with at some fundamental, fundamental level. It means that, as I said last week, that understand that your right theology can be wrong if you're not bearing with one another and caring for one another in your right theology. It means that you consider your neighbor's good in every circumstance of life that you live. And these are hard things. It doesn't fit right with us. It's the calling, though, and not pleasing ourselves, but pleasing our neighbors. And as we've seen, Paul continues to point to Jesus as the clearest example of this sort of self-denial. After all, as the Son of God, as the Most High God, he clearly, have had his, he clearly could have had his way in anything that he had wanted to, but he didn't come into the world that way. In fact, the Bible tells us that he came into the world to suffer the reproach of men, which is what Paul reminds us of there in verse 3, if you continue through it, Romans chapter 15. And of course, Jesus also came into the world to experience the reproach of God on our behalf. When he laid down his life on the cross, when he died for us, he suffered a punishment that we all deserve, and he became sin so that we might become the righteousness of God. So in other words, he didn't come into the world to please himself, but to please us, to carry us, and to give us what we needed. The clearest example of how to be a Christian is lived out in Christ himself. And it's even amazing to me that Paul quotes Psalm 69 in verse 3 uh, to kind of back this up. Now, this reference to Psalm 69 would have triggered a series of associations for people, especially for the Bible people that would have been the audience that would have read this in Paul's day. Now, I wish we had time to read this psalm. You can if you want to. It's many verses, so we don't have the time to read it today. But let me just tell you about it, because I did read it this week, and let me tell you what the point of it is, and I realized some things that help shed light on what Paul is doing here. Because Paul quoted it, because number one, if you read Psalm 69, you will learn that it's clearly messianic. It totally is. 
I mean, the gospel writers quote it and allude to it several times in their portrayal of Christ's life and sufferings to show us it's actually about Jesus Christ. So not just one gospel writer, and there's several places in Psalm 69 where it's quoted in the gospels. So it's clearly messianic. But weirdly, it's also a psalm attributed to King David. And importantly, this is something to note. It's a lament psalm. It's a psalm of lamenting the injustice of the world. And in typical pattern of a lament psalm, David cries out to the Lord because of his own unjust suffering. This is Psalm 69, verses 1 through 12, and also a middle part in verses 19 through 21. He calls on God to deliver him from those things in Psalm 69, verses 13 through 18, and then punish his enemies, which is also part of a lament psalm in 69, 22 through 28, and ends by praising God for his faithfulness and for his salvation in Psalm 69, 22 through 36. Now, I tell you all that because the crazy thing is when the gospel writers apply this to Jesus, we recognize that Jesus is going through something similar in his own life, a lament in his life on earth. He's experiencing injustice. He's crying out to the Lord because of his own unjust suffering. He's punishing his enemy. You know what his enemy was? death. (laughs) That's who he's punishing. And he cries out to God for salvation. This is Jesus's story. In fact, what's amazing is Paul shows us that Christ was the true and better, uh, better David here, who also endured unjust suffering at the expense of another, was the perfect servant of God in a way that gave us the example. And his ultimate concern was not for his own pleasure and desires, but for God's will to be done. Don't forget Jesus's prayer in Matthew 26, 39. My father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but your will be done. Friends, in Christ, we have the ultimate example of someone who bore with and was pleasing to other people. And in this selfless work of Christ on our behalf, it shows us how we ought to live, absorbing others' wrongs and weaknesses. And amazing to me, even in the Psalm 69 pictures, we get that Jesus did this, if that was indeed written about his own perspective, he did it in directed at the Lord himself. And so he didn't just always do it in behalf of someone else, but he did it to please the Lord as well. And so sometimes even doing this, you might say, how do I do this when that person is so difficult for me? Well, sometimes you don't do it for them. Sometimes you do it for the Lord. You do everything you can to please him above all else. Now, it's no wonder in verse 4 that Paul's on the subject of this. So in Romans 15, verse 4, he tells us the entire point of the the Old Testament in that verse. Uh, What do we do with the Old Testament? Paul says, well, you learn from it. You learn from these experiences, and we are to find hope in it is what we are supposed to do. This parallels, of course, 1 Corinthians 10, where we're told the same basic message. And the instruction and the hope that we are to find are, don't miss what Paul says, through endurance and through encouragement. Because the people of the Old Testament needed to learn this time and time again, just like we do today. This is probably why Romans 15.5 parallels this, where we are told that we have the God of endurance and the God of encouragement, who grants us the ability to actually live in harmony with one another like Jesus did. So we can live out the beautiful Romans 15.6 vision, that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. So friends, the picture here is glorious takes work, but it's glorious. That in Christ, we can be a church in which young and old worship together, where ethnic diversity is important to us, and we talk about it and celebrate what God has done in creating a family of many different nations under heaven together, where the divisions that bug us can be overcome by hope and endurance, and where we consistently fight against the flesh of our own understanding because Paul says it's in accordance with Christ Jesus that we do this. This is Christ the example. This is the image we get. And it's possible. It's possible because of Christ. Well, there's one more. It leads to the final portrait of Christ the example. And Paul says there's one other way that Jesus did this as the example. He actually welcomed you. And so welcoming one another is the final example of Christ. Therefore, welcome one another in Romans 15, 7, as Christ has welcomed you. This is the example. You see that he bore one another This is Christ's example in bearing one another and not pleasing ourselves, but pleasing our neighbors, and finally in welcoming one another. I love these images here. I mean, it is a miracle that Jesus welcomed me and you into his family without prejudice or discrimination. That to me is amazing. This was the way it was since the start of Jesus' ministry. Think about it. Let me 
think, I want, I want to paint one more picture for you this morning of the church of Jesus in the early days, all right? And so I know it's church, but let's just think of the people he gathered around him in his ministry while he was on earth. And so let me paint a picture of these men who he gathered around him. There was Matthew, the extremely bright, good with numbers rule follower. He was a liberal. He was a tax collector, a person who would be considered a traitor by many of his contemporaries because he willingly worked for big bad Rome. And in case you didn't know, Rome wasn't exactly the poster child of justice or governmental policies that would fit with the conservative mindset. If he lived in our day, today, he'd probably listen to NPR, be concerned about climate change, and would certainly be the type that was first in line for the COVID vaccine. He was welcomed by Jesus. There was Simon, who was described as a zealot. This guy was the gun-toting, right-wing, Harley-riding freedom fighter who would literally scare the women and the children. He's the crazy uncle that comes to your family barbecue every year, and you're equally morbidly curious and incredibly nervous to talk to him about the crazy things that he's going to tell you. Needless to say, you don't follow him on Facebook, all right? He's... Vaccine hesitant, we'll say, all right? He's welcomed by Jesus. There's Andrew, the adventure-seeking wanderer that decided to take some time to travel to find himself before taking over dad's business and settle down into real life. He sold his stuff, bought a Westie and a dog, and headed out on the road without an itinerary. He ran into some crazy guy in the woods named John and decided to join life in a commune for a time because he always considered himself spiritual but not religious. He makes fun of anyone who works for the big corporations out there, and he's still never even heard of COVID. (laughs) He's welcomed by Jesus. There's Thaddeus, the quintessential middle child, although side note, I don't know if he really was or not, I'm just making that up. He's always forgotten, and his name gets confused by everyone else, including the gospel writers, if you didn't know that. He's a solid dude, but no one knows it because he just sort of, sort, of, sort of fades in the background wherever he goes. This isn't because he wants to. It just sort of happens that when he's surrounded by people like Peter and John, he kind of mixes into the background a bit. Uh, he's so amazed that he's part of this first church that one day he expresses his amazement to Jesus that he got to be included in this and wondered why the rest of the world didn't, and he got called into it as well. He was always mistaken for an introvert, though he wasn't. And he was never chosen for the sports teams in school or included in the things all the cool people did. He was real nervous about COVID and he wears masks all the time because it's worth him to him to hang out with all his friends and the people because he just wants to be around them. He's welcomed by Jesus. There's Bartholomew. He's also known Nathaniel, known as Nathaniel, the youth group kid that grew up in church. He flannel graphed every Old Testament Bible story, went to church on Sundays and Wednesdays. He had an Awana vest that weighed him down with all the crowns and jewels and paraphernalia that was on there. He learned how to play acoustic guitar in junior high, both to impress the girls and so that he could be the worship leader in high school. People said he was anointed, is what they said about him. But once he got into college, his faith seemed to struggle a little bit. He mostly started to get cynical and wondered if his faith was ever really his or if it was just his community and acceptance that he was looking for. But one day when he was praying to the Lord, the Lord showed up and his faith became his own. And now he's figuring out what faith means to him. He's so confused as to what to think about COVID. But he hears about those who have lost their lives and he wonders if there's more he could do. He's welcomed by Jesus. I've given you five pictures of the 12 that were called. These people were all welcomed by Jesus. And have you heard they were so different in their perspectives about life? in their experiences on earth, in their pain, in their struggles, in their way of doing life. They were so different. And Jesus brought them together into his inner circle and said, hey guys, you're one family now. Let's build from this. And Jesus did. We're sitting here today because of what Jesus did with these people. And that is amazing. And if Jesus can do it with these people, we ought to be able to do it as well. Romans 15, 7 is an invitation, friends, to jump out of our comfort zone. We must not serve each other at arm's length. We must invite each other to receive each other, to welcome our brothers and sisters into our hearts and into our lives, in spite of sometimes all the ways that we think they're wrong. 
And why? Because this is the example that Jesus set for us. Indeed, he even went further than this, did he not? For he didn't just welcome people out of few misunderstandings. He didn't just come to redeem people who were basically in line with God's will, only having a few minor issues here and there. No, when Christ received us, when Christ received me, he received a sinner who was offensive to him and abused him because of my choices, because of our choices. And when Jesus gave up his life on the cross, he died to pardon people who were nothing more than rebels, nothing more than living their own way. And since Christ brought sinners like me and you into the kingdom, and since Christ welcomed sinners who had no right to enter his presence, what reason have we to possibly remain estranged from under any other brother and sister in Christ that's out there today? This is a hopeful future I have. This is the portrait of Jesus as the example. And Paul tells us to do this at the very end there for the glory of God. This is what he says to do it. Do this all for the glory of God. And that's his big concluding remark. Well, the second portrait, it's not going to take as long as the first portrait. It's Christ the servant. And that's in Romans 15, 8 through 12. And we see here he was a couple, he was a, 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 a servant for a couple of reasons according to the text. And I don't know if you saw these or not in Romans 15, 8 through 9. It says, for I tell you that Christ became a servant to the circumcised to show God's truthfulness in order to confirm the promises given to the patriarchs and in order that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy. You see these two reasons? Number one is in order to show God's faithfulness to the Jewish people is the first one. This is why he's a servant. Paul once again engages in some awesome biblical theology, full Bible biblical theology here, and we've covered this at length in Romans 9 through 11. You can talk to us about that later if you want to. But he reminds us in this moment that this is part of Christ's job as the servant to come to his fellow Jewish people. If you remember Jesus' words in Matthew 15 where he says, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And so Israel, Paul insists here, has a unique place in God's plan by virtue of being God's chosen people. But Christ also became a servant to not only the Jewish people, but to the Gentiles in order that they might glorify God. Paul doesn't forget the main theme of Romans here. In fact, he says the main theme is that God is faithfully fulfilling his promises to his people Israel while at the same time accomplishing his purpose for bringing the Gentiles fully into becoming the people of God. Once again, this big image of everything he just worked in Christ, the example about to make one family, is being played out in how Christ served both Jew and Gentile to build that family of people who were so different, so different. And then he quotes several scriptures. In fact, in Romans 15, 9 through 12, Paul quotes four different Old Testament texts in rapid succession to show that the Old Testament promise from the very beginning was that the Gentiles were always part of the plan of God. And they even mention Gentiles by name in every single one of these verses, if you saw them. And Paul quotes from an entirety of the Hebrew Bible. It's really interesting how he quotes this because he quotes from both the Torah, the Nebi'im, which is the prophets, and the Ketuvim, the writings. And if you've heard of the Hebrew Bible, it's called the Tanakh, the T-N-K, Tanakh, uh, Torah, Nebi'im, Ketuvim. He quotes a, a mix of all of these to help people understand that he's talking about a whole picture of who Jesus is or what he's done to come to save the Gentiles. And it starts with this plan, gives us this amazing picture, and leads to a promise. And three times in three verses, God shows that the Gentiles and Jews will rejoice together in one family. And Christ the servant makes this not only possible, but a reality that will be experienced by those who are in Christ together. This is amazing. Now you know, it would be extraordinarily easy to conclude that unity is the point of my message today, or even the point of Romans 14 and 15. But what if I was to tell you that's not correct? It's not unity that's the point. The vision in verses 9 through 11 and in verse 6 reveals that unity is actually a pathway to something even greater than unity. Did you see this? It's amazing. Unity is not for our own sake, nor is it Paul's highest aspiration for the church that all people should just live in unity and peacefully with one another. His ultimate desire, check this out in Romans 15, is that we should glorify God together. The point of Romans 15 is worship, friends. The point of Romans 14 is worship. I mean, this is the point. And unity is a pathway, a roadway, maybe I would say a highway to get us there. And God is honored when the church, when it's beautifully diverse and it stands shoulder to shoulder shoulder with one voice praising him together in their unity of purpose, in their unity of mind, fighting for togetherness as much as they can. And God is glorified when we worship in that way. And if you didn't know, this is the point of the entire Bible. 
It's everything. This is Romans five, or excuse me, Revelation 5 and 7. Quintessentially the most beautiful pictures of what we are looking forward to as the kingdom of God on earth, waiting for the kingdom to be present with us forever. Check it out. And they sang a new song, saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and open its seals. For you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God, from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. Then I looked, and I heard around the throne, and the living creatures and the elders, the voice of many angels, numbering myriads and myriads and thousands and thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. What does that sound like? It's like worship, doesn't it? Worship around the throne, what the ultimate purpose of our lives are. Revelation 7, after this I looked and behold a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes, with palm branches in their hands and crying out with a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Worship. Worship is once again happening in the context of the new creation that God is establishing for us who are working together in unity to see that be fulfilled in either this life and or the next. The church of Jesus must live in this unity to glorify God. This is our only hope, friends. No wonder Paul's entire point of this whole thing is to push us towards this hope. To Romans 15, 13, one of my favorite verses of all time, and even what the imprint podcast is named after, where he says, may the God of hope then fill you with all joy and peace in believing. Believing what? What I just laid out. I just laid it out for you. I just hopefully helped you understand what you're supposed to be believing in so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, this is Holy Spirit empowered, we can't just do it on our own, we may what? Abound in hope. It may spring out of us a well of hope for us in the work of the church, in the future of the church, in the hope of what the church can offer, not just to the world, but to one another, a place of unity that leads to a place of worship. I love this. May the God of hope is a prayer for Paul, from Paul, to the church, to the church in Rome, to the church in the world, to imprint church today. Paul's hope is that God, the God of hope, will fill every believer with all joy and peace. And with this joy and peace that we are experienced through faith, Paul says we will have it through believing and that the Holy Spirit will give us this hope. This is what I want for us. So let me end today with where I begin. Because I started by telling us about the things in the church that can raise alarm and cause a lot of us pessimism about the church. And we should not ignore these things by any means. And we should work hard to correct where we need to correct Bring justice where needs to be brought justice, but hear me here and hear me really importantly. God's perspective of the church is hope. Hope. That's what you have. That's what you should have. Don't allow the narrative of the age to bring you down and say, there's no hope for the church. It's hogwash. There's hope. Paul wants you to have hope in that. God wants you to have hope. Because of, the Christ, because of Christ's example and because of Christ's service to the church, We can and should be part of an imperfect family of God that is working as best as we can about glorifying God through our unity, through our diversity, and through our sure belief that the promises of God will truly come true. Let's pray about these things together. Thank you, Lord, for your word this morning. God, I love Romans 14 and 15. It's been balm to my soul as I just admit on behalf of us all, this has been a rotten year. And it's been a year where I think we just wonder what the hope and the future of the church really is. And then we look at something like Romans 15 and we go, no, we're called to abound in hope because of this beautiful picture that we have that we as the church gets to take part in today and every day and into the future, into the new kingdom. And that's amazing, Lord. And I pray, Lord, that you would help us to live in this hope. God, I pray you wouldn't help us to you would help us not to, to ignore the things that we can work on and fix and, and to work hard at these things as Christ is our example and there are things that we have to work on. But we may we never get so pessimistic about the church that we lose hope, Lord, because that's not the point. The point is to have the hope in what you call us to. So Lord, I pray that every person who walks out of here today would find great joy in the gift of being able to be part of the church together. This is a gift. 
be able to sit here. Someone was praying right before, Rose was praying right before we got in here to remember a year ago we were meeting outside in the hot summer day, worshiping together, and then we hadn't been able to meet for a while because we were on stupid Zoom or whatever it was, and man, (laughs) and we're now together in the same room, Lord, and that's amazing, and I'm so grateful for that this morning. I pray we wouldn't take it to granted. We don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. We don't know uh, what's going to happen in our world, but we do know we have a sure hope in the work of Jesus on our behalf and the work of what Jesus is doing in the church. So help us live in that, Lord, I pray. Thanks for this time. We pray and commit ourselves to you now in Jesus' name. Amen.